Um, in the chat box, can you write in just a few words what your goal is by being at this webinar? What is it to do? So just write two, and let's see what kind of goals we've got for being here today. Okay, good one, Laura, to learn what a visible goal is, to learn more, to get inspiration, to get to know and define what visible goals are. Okay, to keep teenage students motivated, good goal, good goal. To get new ideas, to get more tools, to turn demotivation into motivation, Elena. Yep, okay. Excellent. So, to get a certificate, good answer, Wang. That's another goal. Lots of different role, goals. Okay, cool. To measure success. All right, an interesting mix there. Now, um, we assume that goals are a good thing in language teaching. We kind of take them for granted and certainly in um, World English. Now, at the moment, I'm working on World English 3rd edition. This is the second edition. Anybody use World English out there? Just say you do or type WE in the box. A few people use World English. That's okay. If you've never used it, doesn't matter. The, the webinar is relevant anyway. Mohammed thinks they're amazing. Good. Okay. few people using World English. Well, what you're looking at here, that's okay, payment, doesn't matter. Uh, what you're looking at here is the opening spread of a unit in World English. And we tend to use goals quite a bit. So, for example, if you look at the bit that I've circled in red there, we have unit goals. And each unit has five goals and we have five lessons and so each lesson is driven by a goal and when you go to the page you will see the goal at the top so the goal of this lesson is to enable students to talk about organizing a trip okay so that's the plan and then you'll notice on the page we also have something called a goal check and the idea of the goal check is that by the end of the lesson students will be able to check if they've achieved the goal that you stated at the beginning so the goal is there right at the beginning and then right at the end Mohammed's asked an interesting question is it just semantics aim goal outcome um, I will come on to terminology in a minute, Mohammed, but good question. So we put goals at the beginning of the lesson and then we test the goal at the end. And when we do the goal check at the end, that's how we measure success in the lesson. Somebody mentioned um, the aim of this session was to how do we measure success. Having a goal check at the end is a way to do that. That's why we have goals. However, not everybody agrees that goals necessarily are always a good thing. It depends how we define them. So let's explore what a goal is or the, the issues behind goal. Now, I've taken some of the ideas from an excellent book here by Kathleen Graves called Designing Language Courses. There's a whole chapter on writing goals. So if you're somebody who has to write goals and so on, very good book published by National Geographic Learning. Um, but basically, Kathleen introduces this issue of whether goals are useful or not, and she presents two different opinions. So there's teacher A. Teacher A says, but you have to have clear goals before a lesson. Otherwise, how do you know what to teach and what you want students to learn? So that would be the argument for having goals. Teacher B might put a counter argument which says but the problem is goals get in the way because they force students to follow a path that might not be right for them and this is the argument of people who quote second language acquisition theory at you because they say students don't necessarily learn things in the order we would like them to so therefore our goals might be forcing them in a way that they don't naturally want to learn. 
These are two opposing opinions. I thought we'd do a quick poll just to get your feel. So, Emily, if you can drag the poll over, I'd like you to click a response to those two opinions. Do you mainly agree with teacher A or agree with teacher B? Let's see what the group thinks. A lot of you agreeing with teacher A at the moment. That's okay for being late, Iruna. Okay, we're nearly there. Looks like the majority are mostly agreeing with teacher A. Julian raises a good question. The idea of one path to achieve the goal is questionable. I think that's why we're perhaps we're mostly agreeing with A, but the majority would mostly agree with teacher A. In general, we think goals are a good idea. We tend to like goals in our life because also goals for students are motivating and they're also motivating for teachers and they define what we're going to do. In, in, in general, my opinion would be similar to most of you. I did mostly agree with A, and I, did, I understand the opinion of B to some extent. And I like what Maiton's just written. The idea is to adapt the lesson to our own students' goals so the goals don't get in the way of the lesson. Um, in order to illustrate the point, um, what I generally would like to say, I think um, the image of abstract art that you can see on the screen, it kind of represents the real way we learn language. Students all learn languages in different ways and they learn items in language in different orders. We acquire things in different order. One student might learn one aspect of language first, uh, another student another. Uh, certain students will make mistakes all the time and other students will make different mistakes. So language learning is messy. Language acquisition is messy. So in one argument is it's very difficult to put a goal on it. Um, and as Payman says, can we really channel learning to specific outcomes? But I think from a practical point of view, if you think of language acquisition being similar to a piece of abstract art, in order to be able to understand it and to be able to talk about it and measure it, it's very useful to put it into a frame. And like putting a frame around the painting, it's useful to put goals around our lessons because it helps us to make sense of it and it helps with motivation. If we have no frame, students don't know what direction they're going in, they don't know what the next step is. We're human beings, we need a goal, we need a framework. All that we have to remember is that the frame, if you like, shouldn't become more interesting or more important than the artwork within it. In the same way, the goal that we put around language shouldn't overtake the personal needs of the learner in a particular lesson. Diego's written something nice. Language learning is messy. Teaching shouldn't be. Interesting angle. I quite like that one. Yeah. Uh, teaching shouldn't be, but teaching should allow for the messiness, I think, Diego, is what we're saying, yeah? Um, and I think the, yes, Judith, the frame just makes a little bit more sense of the image. We can, we can get our heads around it. Um, we'll come on to responsiveness in a minute, Julian, and we'll come back to this point. But this is why I think a goal is, is a helpful starting point. Okay, in this session we're going to look at three types of goals. I'm going to talk about forward planning goals, which are the kinds of goals that teachers write and course books write. 
the, the goals that we set out at the outset and help us to plan a course. I'm then going to talk about what I would call backward planning goals and what success looks like. And the idea being that sometimes we need to visualize what the goal is because it's more motivating. And what would that mean if we define what success would look like, if we make the goal more visible is what we're going to look at. And the third type of goal is what I'm calling student driven goals or the students personal goals. Every lesson has the goal that's in the course book or the goal of the teacher. But meanwhile, your students have their own individual personal goals and we can build in visible goals into our teaching activities that will help to motivate students. OK, let's get going. We're going to start with. Uh, forward planning goals and what do the teachers goals look like okay by teachers goals it might be the goal in the course book it might be the goal at the top of your lesson plan so if you've ever done a teacher training course you've had to write beautiful lesson plans and write goals at the top by goal I could also mean lesson aim I don't see a particular difference now, this is an approach by uh, Kathleen Graves to help plan lessons and to help achieve a goal. And Kathleen would say that every lesson needs a goal. And then you have your objectives or what we might call your sub aims in order to achieve the goal. So it's like a cause and effect. So here's the goal of our lesson. By the end of this lesson, students will be able to tell a story in English. In the chat box, can you suggest some of the things that you might actually teach students in order to achieve that goal? Because there are sub aims or objectives within it. What might you have to teach students? OK, the narrative tense is good answer, Mohammed, because that's my first objective. Vocabulary, Eleanor, you guys are good. Learn the vocabulary you need for a particular story. Karina, using comics, it might be that's kind of a slightly procedural age. Lydia has given another one using discourse markers. And many of you are giving lots of other suggestions, but that's nice. Great. So straight away, we've basically defined our goal. And then we think about what are the things that they will need to achieve it. Those are our objectives. And that helps us really quickly work out what we're going to do in the lesson in order to achieve the goal. And I find Kathleen Gray's definition very accessible. It's an easy way to think about lesson planning. Um, and also this structure of the sentence, by the end of this lesson, students will be able to tell a story. Thinking of by the end of the lesson is a nice way of thinking visibly what will students need to have done by the end of the lesson. We can kind of imagine the lesson. So that would be my definition of a goal. You could call it an aim. Some course books might call it an outcome. But that's basically what it is. OK. Um, other little things that you can do with goals to improve them. Uh, Mohammed's made a comment. We can say that goals are teacher relevant and objectives are learning for the goals. Yes, what I'm talking about at the moment are the goals that teachers write mainly for themselves. And one of the questions we perhaps ask is how aware are our students of goals? Now, I could say to my students, in today's lesson, we're going to learn how to tell a story in English. That's a very accessible goal. If I said to my student, in today's lesson, we're going to do some grammar to help you with narrative tenses, my students wouldn't understand that necessarily, not as clearly. So the goal is important, and then the technical stuff is within the objectives. There are other techniques for making your goals more useful. One of the techniques I use is what I call the what, who, where test. 
This is for my own personal lesson planning. If I want to write a goal, I apply the what, who, where test. Here's how it works. For me, a really useful goal or lesson aim should include what I want the students to learn, but also who they're going to be communicating with and where or how they're going to communicate. Let me give you an example. Here's a goal. By the end of this lesson, I will have enabled students to order a meal. What does that aim answer? What, who, or where? What does it tell me? What, who, or where? Just type it in. What? Very well. Graziana wins the um, wins all of them. <laughs> um, it's telling me what? It's telling me to order a meal. That's basically what I'm doing. If I want to make this goal more useful for me in terms of my planning, I could extend it. So now my lesson aim, because I visualized what I want students to do, the what is I want them to discuss a menu and I want them to order a meal. But the question is, who are they doing these things with? They could discuss the menu with a work colleague or a very important guest. But I want them to discuss a menu with a friend. Now, that's important that I know that because it changed the level of register of the language that I'm going to teach. I won't be teaching formal language. I'll be teaching informal language. They're going to be ordering a meal with a waiter. Um, the alternatives might be maybe they're ordering the meal over the phone if it was a takeaway, but I need to know who they're talking to. And then where are they doing it? Well, they're doing it in a restaurant, and I could possibly add more detail. I could say, oh, it's in a fast food restaurant or it's in a five-star restaurant, and that might change the type of language that I'm going to expose students to. But by applying the what, who, where test, it allows me to visualize what students will be doing by the end of the class. So it's a nice visualization tool for teachers, and it makes your goals, your um, ideas much more effective. Let's try this. I'm going to type in a new goal. Um, OK, so here's a new goal in the chat box. I'm answering what. How could I add more information to that? What could I say about who and where? So I will have enabled students to make a presentation or give a presentation to who and to where at a conference. It could be at a work conference, which would affect the language. Yeah. It could be in a business presentation. It could be at school, so that might change the type of language, or in the classroom. Yes, also Judith raised the issue, what is the presentation about? So I could add more information. So it's to make a presentation at school to classmates, and maybe to make a presentation about their favorite hobby, for example. Or it could be a presentation about sales targets. The point is that by doing the what, who, where test and increasing the size of your goal, it helps you, the teacher, to visualize what you're doing in class. And it also makes it more visible to the students. They can see the purpose of it. Because suddenly, I'm not just learning a presentation because the teacher wants me to. Um, I'm giving a presentation because it's about my own country, as Linda suggested. I'm talking to my classmates. I want to share information. Or it's for my job. So it's suddenly more motivating. So what, who, where is really useful. Okay. Giving a presentation at the bus station. You could, Omar, if, if somebody wanted you to uh, present the different buses you might be going to. It's all about precision, basically. Okay. Uh, another way of writing goals that I like is the so that um, idea, the so that principle. 
The idea of so that is that you add it to the goal so students see the relevance. And it basically answers the question, if a student says, teacher, why are we doing this in class today? If you've included so that in your goal, they will understand why. And it's very easy to apply. You write so that in the middle of your goals. And let's look at some learning goals a teacher might have written. By the way, this is all coming from the ideas of Zoe Elder. Zoe Elder has a really interesting blog which is listed at the bottom of that slide. Um, and this is just one of her ideas. She's writing about education in general, but I've adapted the idea for language teaching. So if you imagine that um, our goal of the lesson is to enable students to use the past simple, a student might say to you, but why, teacher, why am I learning the past simple? And you would say, well, you're learning to use the past simple so that you can write about your grandparents' lives. Or you're learning to read quickly for keywords so that you can understand the main meaning of a lecture and take notes. Or I want to enable you to learn words for the name of transport so that you can talk about the best ways to travel to work. This side, you've got the learning goals. And on this side, you've got the outcomes. OK? So by writing so that in your goals, you guarantee some sense of purpose to the activity. And you'll notice on this side, the outcomes are very visible. Suddenly, students can see, recognize why they're doing the goals. Yet, yeah, linked to can-do statements, Julian. It's not, it's not necessarily new, but just using so that in your lesson planning will really improve the quality of your goals. Okay? That's all. But it's a nice little linguistic tool to help, uh, to help with your lesson planning. Okay? If any of you are doing teacher training courses and having to write lesson plans, these are all little techniques you can uh, do to improve your class. And it also makes the lesson planning much easier because you've added more detail. So suddenly I can look at that goal and think, OK, I know what today's lesson's about. Um, in the first one, to use the past simple so students can write about their grandparents' lives, I'm going to teach them the past simple, but I'm also going to give them vocabulary to talk about grandparents' lives, maybe give them time expressions and that kind of thing. OK? All right. Just an idea for tweaking goals. Now, I've been talking about forward planning goals. And forward planning goals kind of make assumptions as teachers. Forward planning goals that mean in our minds before the lesson, we, we see the lesson as a very straight line. And this was the criticism of teacher B, that we start here, and when we plan a goal, we get here. Now, in reality, is that true? No, not usually. <laughs> no, no, not at all. In reality, sometimes, Jessica. OK, the reality looks more like the second diagram. This is reality, where you kind of have a goal at the beginning of the class, and then you kind of wander around, very like the abstract art. Um, and you might get close to the goal, but sometimes you miss the goal. I don't think it matters, actually. And in a way, the more messy the line, probably the more language learning has gone on. Because if language learning was a straight line like this, well, we probably wouldn't have to work quite so hard. Um, but in fact, the second diagram represents a lot of learning that's been going on in the, mess the lesson. And also, if you get close to the goal, but you just miss it, that's very motivating because we get close to the goal and the student thinks, OK, for homework or at my next lesson, I'm going to try to get to the goal. And mastery of the goal is one of the things that motivates us. So it's important. However, 
that's a result of forward planning. There is a second approach, which is what we could call backward planning. It's like herding cats, Olive says, yes. Uh, there's also a backward planning approach, was what does success look like? Now, I've been talking about goals that we plan before the lesson happens. But let's, what, what if we started at the end and worked our way backwards? Um, for example, sometimes if we plan goals, it's a bit like doing flat pack furniture. Has everybody tried to build an IKEA piece of furniture? Lots of people, some people, but you know basically, you basically know exactly, uh, Juan, what a nightmare, a complete nightmare. I hate doing it. This kind of, if you saw um, this diagram, the one here, um, what do you think I might be constructing? Anybody guess what I'd be making? A bunk bed, solar panel, shelves, bookcase, and so on and so on and so on. Think about the IKEA instruction manual is a bit like if you walk into class and you say, OK, today, students, we're going to do the past simple. Then we're going to do discourse markers. Then we're going to do some vocabulary. It's very confusing for students because they don't know what success looks like. They don't have a perception. So if you say today we're going to teach grammar, that isn't motivating for students because they don't know what it looks like. Success actually looks like this. It's a bookcase. And if I can see the bookcase first, and I know what the bookcase looks like, then my instruction manual becomes much easier to follow, and I can see the purpose of it. And I'm more motivated because I know what success looks like. And this is a sense of what we would call backward planning. If you can see what the goal looks like at the end, and then you plan back from there, then, if you like, the deconstruction becomes much more motivating for students. Uh, let's think about how this might uh, work in reality. Okay. Earlier, earlier I showed you this goal. Uh, by the end of the lesson, all students will be able to discuss a menu with a friend in order to, in, and order a meal from a waiter in a restaurant. That was my forward planning goal. But backward planning would say, actually, what, what do you see the students doing at the end of the class? By the end of the lesson, what will success have looked like? Well, to achieve this goal, students will have read and understood the menu. They'll have asked their friend and the waiter about the dishes. They'll have ordered a meal from the waiter. And they'll have probably asked for the bill and paid for it. Now, these are in a sense, can-do statements. This is what we do with can-do statements. But what I'm trying to do here is to define my goal in terms of what the end of the lesson looks like. And the advantage of that is that I can also give it to students who can then see what I'm trying to check by the end of the lesson, which was my idea of goal checks that I mentioned from World English. So in a sense, the can-do checklist at the end is giving some students something very visible, and it's saying, check your progress, check your success, and self-score yourself. Give yourself a smiley, another face, or an unhappy face, and just tick which of those things you've done. And if you haven't done all of them, that's fine, because we don't always achieve our goals but it will motivate you more to get it right the next time we do that similar role play. It's not rocket science, but it's just a different approach to start from the end of the lesson 
and then plan your lesson backwards because as the teacher you look at your checklist and say okay what do I need to do with students to allow them to tick the smiley face for all four of those items that's that's all that backward planning is to some extent but also the other thing is to introduce this idea is to show students what success looks like and to do that we can actually use video and if you've been to my previous webinars you'll know how much I like video um, one of the real advantages of video is if you show it at the beginning and you show people using the language you want to teach in a way that you want the students to do it, students see it in the video and then they know what you want to achieve by the end of the lesson. Let me give you an example. So my goal, for example, is to enable students to show surprise and amazement. Okay. My objectives might be to teach the students how to use phrases like, wow, that's amazing, that's fantastic. It might be to practice rise, fall, intonation to show surprise and amazement. Now, I can tell students those goals, but it's so much more effective if I show them a video with it happening. And if I can get an authentic video, that's even better. So what I'm going to do is take a short break and I'm going to show you a video from World English called A New View of the Moon. And it's about a man who takes his telescope out onto the street. But listen to the reactions of the people who look through the telescope. And if you show this to your students, they would know exactly what you want to achieve by the end of the lesson. OK, Emily, so let's play the video. This we're using this level at sort of elementary to low, good end at elementary level, Mohammed. One night I was bored in my apartment and decided to take my telescope out to the sidewalk. The moon was out and I thought, why not? Within a few minutes, people started walking over and asking what this thing was. Hey, what is that, bro? It's a telescope. Whoa. Do you want to check out the moon? Do you want to take a look at the moon? What is it? It's the moon. Where am I supposed to look? You're supposed to look right here. Oh, in the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's where it all started. It just sort of went from there. Oh my gosh! Whoa! That is... Oh, Tommy! Check this out! Oh, oh man! Oh man! Is that awesome? Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. No way. No way. No way. That's a moon? No way. Yeah, way. <laughs> no. Well, you can see the craters. Yeah. yeah. That is so cool. Oh, my God. Get closer, get closer, get closer. Get wider. I've never seen this before. Oh, crazy. this is amazing. Wow, that is intense right there, boy. Woo, bro, that look like that's right down the street, man. <laughs> man, what you got here, man? That look like that's right down the street. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's right. Is that an actual image of the moon? Is it like a live moon? It's that right there. be able to see it up close and feel like you could almost reach out and touch it and that's what makes it real to us. That is incredible. I kind of felt like I just landed on the moon. <laughs> it makes you realize that we are all on a small little planet and we all have the same reaction to the universe we live in. Wow. Whoa. I think there's something special about that, something unifying. 
it's a great reminder that we should look up more often. Okay, thanks, Emily. Great video, very moving, very interesting. It's authentic, it's uh, engaging. But of course, the first time I watched it with my language teacher hat on, I'm thinking, oh, I just show this to the students, and suddenly they know what I want them to do by the end of the class. Um, and so the the point is with setting visible goals that using things like video you can show that at the beginning of the class and then the students know exactly why they're doing it whereas in the past uh, if I'd been teaching the language of phrases like wow that's amazing incredible I probably would have had to listen to a, a recording a listening and have students listen and repeat and students would have done it but they wouldn't have been motivated by the visible outcome that they've seen in the video and that's where the difference comes and it's a way of backward planning because you start with the video and if you get the video right you get the right kind of authentic video and you work backwards you build the lesson plan uh, around it and you get the goals that way um, and it's another way of backward planning and it's something we're trying to do quite a lot in the New World English series because we're including a lot more video with uh, authentic kind of English used in that way. Um, so that video, yes, will be in uh, level one of World English. So there's an intro level which is kind of beginner, level one, level two, level three. We've put it in uh, level one. Okay, time is moving on. Uh, my third and final area is student-driven goals. What do students think success looks like? Um, I've talked about the teacher's goals, the course book's goals, but within any lesson, a student comes with their own personal goals, as you all know. And sometimes the goal of the teacher or the goal of the course book is not always necessarily the goal of the student. The other thing is students need goals that are personally and visibly motivating and we can build those into certain activity types and so for the remainder of this uh, webinar I'm just going to give you some suggested uh, ideas of the types of things you might do in class that will help students uh, feel motivated um, to achieve their goals. Uh, I'm just reading Jessica's comments. Success for them is to be able to use the language in their own ideas. Perfectly put. Perfectly put. Um, let's start with one or two uh, ways of visualizing success and achieving our goals. One of my favorite uh, techniques with all students is to encourage students to do their own self-testing. I'm sure all of you have used this kind of tool. I'm going to show you this is a box that I use in my class. It exists. I use it with my students. And I encourage students when they meet a new word to write it on a piece of paper and put it in the vocabulary box. And then when they come to the next lesson, one side has the word. The other side might have the pronunciation. It might have a definition it might have a gap fill and then when they're sitting on the bus or they're on their way to class or at the beginning of class while we're waiting for everybody to come along um, for example I was doing transport collocations with my students so on one side I've got the transport and on the other side I've got the verb collocation this was with some elementary students so on this side of the paper they've got a taxi and the student picks it up and tries to guess a collocation verb. So give me a verb that's a collocate with taxi in the chat box. Any verb that collocates. 
Maiten gets the thing. It was take. You are correct. Okay. It could have been get attacks. It could have been the others. The point is now that my student scrunches it up because the student got it right and they throw it away. And it's a visible way of seeing progress. It's that getting physically getting rid of it and self-testing. Um, a more high-tech version would be to use Quizlet, which is free online, and there are other learn vocabulary learning apps. Um, but the point is, it's a way of students setting their own goals and measuring their own success. And it's visible. This is what I like about it. It's visible. Here's another example of some achieving visible goals for the student in the classroom. Many of your students are probably motivated by games, competitions, winning and losing. Lots of, lots of people are. Games are also a very visible type of goal because literally the goal is to win the game. Um, but it also good language games have ele elements of self-testing. So one of the things we've done in World English 3rd Edition, which perhaps wasn't in um, other editions, was we've included one or two more games. So in the unit on uh, food, at the end of the unit, we have students, for example, they have to play in a board game, go around the board and say different food words and use food in, a different, in different kinds of ways. Very simple. The other thing that I often use as a teacher is a blank board game. And we're giving you a copy of this as a handout at the end of this webinar. I always have this as an A4 sheet. OK, I put students into groups of three. They have a dice or they toss a coin, heads to move one, tails to move two. They start on the start and they work their way around the board. And we can do different things with this. I can say to students, find 15 items of vocabulary that you've been working on in the last three weeks. Write each item of vocabulary on a square on the board. Then they go round the board. And when they land on the word, they have to use it in a sentence or they have to ask a question with the word. It's very motivating. They can see the point of it. There's a clear goal and it's visible learning because you're seeing the words and you're seeing yourself work around. You can also do it with role play activities with functional language. You could write different role plays the students have done recently. And as they land on the role play, they do the role play with the with the player on their right, for example. And if they do it well, they move forward two spaces. If they do it OK, they move one space. If they get it wrong, they stay on the space. You can create your own rules. But after a while, students get familiar with this and they create their own language board games. But what you're doing is you're just motivating them with sort of um, with, with kind of visible activities in that way. Third idea, um, and this is motivating goals are about challenge. We, I talked earlier about students sometimes not achieving the goal of the lesson and missing the goal. That isn't a bad thing because students want to master it. And if you look at the best sportsmen, sportswomen in the world, mastery is, is, is never achieved. If you think of a great tennis player like Roger Federer, he never stops training hard as a tennis player because he never really feels he's quite mastered the goal. And the same is true with language learning, particularly with your more advanced students. They want to keep feeling there's some the next thing to go for. Um, what you've got on the screen is an activity for vocabulary. And we're giving you a copy of this in the handout as well. So you can try this with your students. Basically, this is like a can-do statement, but the student designs it for themselves. Um, basically, I can understand the word in context, pronounce the words, no other form of word, use a prefix, say a synonym. Students choose seven new words they've learnt this week and they write them in the top part of the table. And then they decide whether they can understand the word, pronounce the word, and they tick it. 
So they end up with something that looks like this. So if they'd been learning adjectives for personal qualities all week, they'd write them in the top, and then they'd start to self-check their, their progress. And their goal is to try to complete the table with ticks. So they put lots of ticks here, and their real goal then is to start ticking this side. And if they can't tick it all, then they have to go away and learn it and they get back. But the visible aspect of it is that they see a complete table, that it's visually filled in, and that makes a difference. That's very motivating for students. Um, anyway, we're giving you a copy of that to try out with your students this week, see how it works for you. It's a nice, um, it's a nice way of giving students autonomy and so on. I want to finish um, the webinar with one final video, which was sent to me by a teacher. Um, it was a video by some students in the Ukraine, and I have to thank, um, sorry, could you just move the video a sec, Emily? That's it. I want to thank Ira and her students in the Ukraine. Now, what happened was, Ira came to a workshop I did where I said, it's a useful activity at the end of a unit to ask, give students the title of the unit and to take a photo and then present, um, present the photo to the class. So Ira had been doing a unit on food and then for homework she said to the students, take a photo called food and then you're going to present it at the next class. So it's, it's, very, visib it's very visible, it's motivating, it requires student autonomy, there's a clear goal, there's a clear visible goal, the photograph. What ERA's students did, without ERA didn't ask them to, they decided to get together as a group and make a video about places to eat in their city. Okay? They just did this on their mobile phone, and they give you a little tour of restaurants around their city using vocabulary that they've learned from the course book. And I thought this was the perfect example of visible goals for students, that they have autonomy, they're trying to achieve mastery, and there's a clear purpose, and it's all visible. Anyway, let's watch a little bit of Iris students telling us about places to eat in their city in the Ukraine. Off we go, Emily. Hello, Ira. <laughs> Today we are going to tell you about the most interesting places in Poltava where you can get some food and drinks. <laughs> That it remembers every flight That it remembers every fight We want to tell you about Kapishka It's a, a small cozy cafe in which uh, uh, you can take away some coffee or drinks and uh, sweets The most interesting scene at the, the place is that the panoramic windows look out over <laughs> The beautiful sky and the center of Poltava. Every night, like you're still holding your father's. Secondly, Halushka is a homestyle looking restaurant with Ukrainian food like borscht, halushki, vareniki, stuffed with meat, and not on. Also, Galushka has very cozy homestyle interior where you can uh, go with your friends and family and spend free time in very funny way. Glass jaw isn't glass anymore. And it was never ironic, it was never smug. Dancing around your handbag in a high street. Certainly you can visit the uh, Shade Burger. Uh, it's place which open facts 
and uh, it always has uh, juicy and tender food. It has out outstanding okay, Emily, let's and stop it there. money. Okay, uh, at the end they say thank you very much to Ira for being a great teacher and I've also seen that Ira videoed her response to the students and she was so excited that the students had taken control and created um, this piece of visible learning, I think we could call it. It's a, it has all the elements of great goal setting for students, the um, autonomy, mastery and purpose that you need. Um, and really doesn't require many technical skills. But uh, nice to see students really doing stuff um, and actually seeing the student output rather than always thinking about what we're doing as teachers. So to sum up, um, we've looked at three types of goals. Forward planning goals is when the teacher, we obviously need these things. And I saw a comment from uh, Julian earlier said, yes, but intrinsic motivation is one thing, but what about the parents, the tests, the exam? I completely agree with you. Forward planning goals are driven by our exams, expectations of the schools we're in. But I still think we can build in student-driven goals through the kind of activity types that we choose um, and, and, and getting students to recognize what success like by giving them examples. And I think video is a good way to do this. Um, one way to improve forward planning goals is to take a backward planning approach and start with the goal at the end. What do you want to see the students doing by the end of the cl class? then work your way backwards okay and it also helps with your planning and remember things like who what where in your planning the so that technique to make your goals more relevant and it really helps with your lesson planning because it, it creates an image of what you want the class to be so it's visible for students but also visible for a teacher and I think a lot of us actually plan our lessons visually rather than writing everything down in that way Okay, um, and then we finish with student-driven goals and a few activities. And don't forget that Emily will be sending you a copy of the handout with the board game on and the challenge vocabulary challenge grid, which you can try out with your students. Kind of revision activities. Do them at the end of the unit to revise things um, and give students a little bit of challenge. Okay, that's the end of what I'm going to say in this presentation. Uh, World English Intro Level 1, 2 and 3 will be coming out uh, later this year and the beginning of uh, next year. And the main feature is that it's very goals driven. You'll see goals throughout and it's very satisfying and feet one of the key features is the goals and teachers who, like, who use the book like it because of the, um, because of the goals and the goal check feature. So try it out. I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Emily unless we've got any questions in the chat box that you want me to address. We've got four minutes. Thank you all for coming. Any quick questions or comments? There will be a recording of the presentation and so you'll be able to pick up on anything that we didn't have time for. What levels does World English cover, Simona? Uh, World English intro is uh, a beginner level. Uh, then there's level one, which is a sort of end of A1, beginning of A2. Oh, Emily's put a link up there, which will tell you more about it. Level two, and I'd say level three probably gets you to around sort of B1 level. Um, Juan said, I use live, should I change to World English? To be honest, it depends on the type of student you're teaching and what your goals are. I think you need to look at the link. 
um, and decide because the books are quite different in style so it will be depending on the type of students you're teaching and what your goals are. Have a look at the link on that um, to get a feel of the kinds of materials in World English. <laughs> Just wanted to create uh, this in here, from World everyone. English to reach uh, C2, for example, you could then switch on to life if you wanted to go beyond for the level three. Uh, and I'm sure book. Emily and people at National there. Geographic this is would brand new out be able this to year. give you more advice like on that as well. More. Definitely let us know. I'm going to finish and there and let Emily take about, over. Thank you very much for attending. Um, books, and she's going to talk about a little bit about another book by the looks of it. You can do that through our website. Um, and you'll just be able to navigate to the representative where you are. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm really glad you could spend an hour of your time with us, and I hope it was useful to you, and I hope you enjoyed this whole webinar. I know I definitely did. Uh, just as we wrap up here, you can always look at our webinar archive. It is eltngl.com webinars. Um, we won't have any more upcoming ones for few months now until about the fall season, but definitely check back and subscribe to email notifications so you can be notified when we do have new ones. Um, we do have an in-focus blog for teachers of English too, and John's a contributor for that as well. Um, for getting the handouts, Helen, we will be sending that in the email, and the email will include a link to the certificate for attending today, as well as a recording, so you can see the video um, John showed if you missed any of it, and the slides from the session as well. Those are posted on our website too. And definitely make sure to connect with us online. We'd love to hear you know, feedback about this webinar and love for you to be part of our virtual community. We're on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on YouTube as well, where we do put the webinar recordings. So definitely be sure to check those out. And just last but not least, we do have a second session tonight of this same exact webinar. It's at um, 9 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, where John's base, so that's UK time, and you can sign up on our website if you did miss any of this. And I'm Judith. I'm going to send you the certificate of attendance that will come in your email about uh, five business days from now. So thanks all for attending. I'm going to send you to a survey now to hear your feedback from the session. Um, we'd love it if you can take some time to fill it out. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of your morning, evening, afternoon. And if you are emailed to contact us, it's ngl.webinars at cengage.com. I see a question about that. And that is on the webinar website in the help section if you ever need to reach us. All right. Bye, everyone.